Are you looking for truth from God's Word that you can understand and apply to your life? You'll find it today on Make It Clear with Dr. Stan Pons, Bible teacher and president of Florida Bible College in beautiful Orlando. Listen now as Stan makes it clear. Now, as I studied the whole concept of truth as it would come out from God, because I believe that so much, I have found that the essence of truth, truth itself, is not just found in God, but it's also found in what we'll call the Holy Trinity. If you will, just listen to some of these uh, verses as I give them to you, and you can jot them down quickly if you'd like. It says that God is the God of truth in Psalm 31.5. Jesus is full of truth in John 1.14 and 17. And of course, John 14.6 says, Jesus speaking, I am the way, the what? The truth and the life. You have the Holy Spirit is known as the spirit of truth in John 14.17 and a whole lot of other verses. So you have God truth, you have Jesus truth, you have Holy Spirit truth. So you have the Trinity is truth in bedrock. But that's just not only the Trinity, or we'll call it God, but he's chosen to reveal that which he wants us to know of himself in truth and what truth is all about in the word. And so Jesus speaking to God the Father, God the Son speaking to God the Father, although they are one, and I believe all this is doing is putting a double stamp on what he's about to pray. He says this, sanctify them, that would be you and me, the believers, set them apart. And then he says, thy word is truth. And so again, if we really want to, be set free today, and we know it's going to be set free because of truth, then the real truth is not necessarily going to come merely from my mouthpiece unless what I'm saying is substantiated by the unadulterated, pure word of God as we have it today, and God has chosen to preserve it for us. So now we have the Trinity, which is truth, and we have the word, which is truth, but there's one passage of scripture that I'd like to show you because it's our faith in the truth that brings us salvation. And if you will, you can hold your place in John chapter 8. And if you look to 1 Thessalonians, if you will, for just a moment, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. I wanted you to see this because as we begin in this portion of John chapter 8, I'm going to talk about believing and I have to open up a little bit about what saving faith is. Those of you that have been with us a long time, I teach this quite a lot. But we have so many visitors here today, guests that are here today, I want you to hear it again. And for you that have heard it, I've got some other insight I'd like to share with you too with that. But let's go back here to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I don't know what translation you have if you didn't come with a Bible. There are Bibles. We put 48 plus Bibles are now in the chairs so you can take them out and And uh, you can then follow along with me. And if you don't have a Bible, you can keep that Bible. It's our gift to you, all right? But verse 13 says this. But we, the Apostle Paul writing here, should always give thanks to God for you. And there's a Thanksgiving sermon there. Brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation. Now, we're not talking about election today. But I want you to know you are chosen for salvation. But how? How is it done? Through sanctification by the Spirit. In other words, it's the act of the Spirit that is the saving factor in here. And then it says, and this is what you want to mark, faith in the truth. And so the faith in the truth is faith in the embodiment of truth, especially the truth as it now comes together around, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Now, some of you might do that, but watch very carefully. It must be the Jesus of the Bible. It must be Jesus who is God, not just Jesus who's a nice man, and I must be saved. If I believe in him and believe in him must mean I live a life that's different and all this kind of stuff, and I have to look and dress and talk, Jesus talk. No, it's far more than that, and we'll talk a little bit more about it. Now, I'm not saying there's more works involved in being saved, but I'm saying what you're believing is in the embodiment of who Christ is. Now, go back, if you will, to John, if you will, John chapter 8. And while you're turning there... I would like to give you another group of verses here to describe those of you who know Christ as Savior. So let's do that for just a moment. How many of you here are positive that if you were to die today, you'd go to heaven? Would you raise your hand because you placed your faith in Christ? Raise your hand, all right? Good. That being said, I want you to listen to this regarding truth. Believers are to worship God in truth, John chapter 4. We are to be committed to truth, Proverbs 23, 23. And being committed to truth, we need to obey the truth, 1 Peter 1, 22. And if we believe the truth and we're committed to the truth and we're obeying the truth, it ought to be because we love the truth. And that's another sermon right there. A lot of people, they hear the truth, they want to do the truth, but they really don't do it out of love. They do it purely out of duty and obligation. That will work, but that shouldn't be for the long haul. I don't know that that's totally sustainable. But when you love the truth, it makes it a lot easier than to obey the truth. But in addition to that, we need to speak the truth, walk in the truth. And I'll end one of my little truth sayings here with this. 
that the Bible says that the church, its reason to exist and its mission is because we are built on the pillars of the truth. And so we are the ones, I would like to say, that we are to know the truth, love the truth, obey the truth. And let me take it a little bit further. I believe we should receive the truth. We should guard the truth. We should preach the truth. We should teach the truth. We should defend the truth. And one more, we should be willing to die for the truth like many believers have done earlier so that we would have the truth and the word preserved for us today through their blood and for us. Now, that being said, I want to talk a little about you and me and being set free. I imagine all of us, and I'm speaking to believers right now for a moment, you would like to be set free. I know that most of you will say, I'm free, I'm free in Christ. And I know spiritually you are, you won't lose your salvation, you'll be saved forever and ever and all of that. But some of you still have some of the shackles of this life, and we all do, we're all going to struggle with it. So let me be more specific. Do you have a habit in your life that you know that displeases the Lord, and when you do it, it makes you feel so yucky, guilty and you hate yourself for doing that i'm not going to tell you what that might be but you know what it might be it's a habit in your life is there some guilt that you're carrying that you know that has been forgiven by the cross but it still pops up there's a little bit of a governor in your life to let you know that you went out of bounds and the spirit is saying "Uh oh and you just keep doing that is there something happening in your life as a believer that you're enslaved now this is key Because when we talk about believing in the truth and abiding in the truth, yes, I trust Christ and I'm forever forgiven. I'm forever free. I'm forever going to heaven. But in my daily walk, I can still be in bondage because while I may believe in the truth, I may not always personally, here it is, abide in or continue in the truth. Now, the beauty of it all is to go back over a couple of my other messages in John chapter 6 specifically to remind you again, you will not lose your salvation But you will lose your intimacy and fellowship with the Lord when you are trapped by whatever that is that's holding you back. And bottom line, and we're going to learn today, is going to be sin. And we don't want that. We want to be free, don't we? I I, I know that I would. So let's go back to John chapter 8, if you will. And let's uh, begin going through this passage here uh, to really know what will really set us free. I, I just love this passage. It's so meaningful. If you will, I want you to just go back one verse. It's not up on the board. It's not in your study notes. I want you to just see where we're going with this. Verse 30 simply says this. Jesus spoke these things. Where did he speak it? In Jerusalem. Where in Jerusalem? In the temple. Where in the temple? Where the treasury was, where the women were at that time, and other men would be there as well. So he spoke these things. And then it says, and many came to believe in him. Verse 31. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him. Now, I don't want to split a hair, but there is a difference between believing God or in Christ, and believing in Christ. And so for just a moment, because it is important for you to know this, because this really sets out what do you believe in, lordship salvation, or discipleship salvation, and all this kind of stuff. How do you make it all fit together? And frankly, sometimes you have to really go into the Word, and sometimes you go into the original language to get it. But let me see if I can help you with this uh, just a little bit. You recall that when I was teaching on what is saving faith, what is the faith that saves you? Now, again, you that are on the other side of Christianity who want to know about it, in order to be saved, in other words, to be saved from hell, to be saved from from our, our sin, saved from all of that junk that's out there, that means I am saved and I am in safety. I'm, I'm, I'm in the safe arms of God forever and ever. That salvation, and there's a whole lot more to it than just that, but the idea of being safe and saved, that in Christ, in God, happens not by my good deeds, whether they're religious or whether they're social good deeds. It's not by good deeds. Watch this. It's not by faith in Christ and good deeds, whether religious or social, it is only by faith in Christ. Now, when I talk about saving faith, what does the Bible have to say about saving faith? Well, if you go back to the theologians, I'm talking way, 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 way back, back when Latin was spoken. We don't speak Latin here, and I'm kind of glad for it. I had Latin when I was in school, and I didn't really know it. But there are three Latin words, but it's not important that you know the Latin words. What is important that you understand that there are three steps to saving faith And they all need to be there. And if you don't arrive at the third step, then you won't be that full belief in Christ for your salvation. Here's the first one. It's notatia. And basically all that means is knowledge or intellect. In other words, in order for you to trust something, you have to be aware of that. You have to know that. You have to hear that as being fact. All right. So that's a little bit of knowledge of it. If you recall, when I had put the chair up here on the platform, I would say, I, I would never sit in that chair if I didn't know that that chair was available for me to, to sit in. I didn't know anything about it. So you're pointing me in the direction of that chair. That's saving faith, number one. But remember, that's not salvation yet. But I could never get to salvation 
if I don't have that. That's why so many Christians are going out into all the world to tell people who never heard about Jesus Christ who Christ is and what he did for them on the cross. Are you, tra- are you tracking with me so far? This is huge. When I was younger, it took very little for me to enter into a discussion about who Christ is and what he did on the cross, blah, 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 blah. Now I'm in my 60s and I go out into the streets and I find so many people in what they now call the postmodernism that they don't even know who Jesus is. And especially on this island that is flooded with all sorts of isms and spasms of all sorts of Eastern religions that have come in and people have grown up with that. And I'm not trying to denigrate the person. I'm just letting you know that they're hearing this. But what they're not knowing is any information about the Bible and Jesus Christ. You have to have knowledge. The second is what we're going to call a census. That's another Latin word, and it means to assent to the facts as being true. So the first, you have to know the facts. Then you have to believe the facts are true. So I could have a chair up here. Now I know that that's a chair. Now I know it's true that this chair was designed so that I could sit in this chair, and if I sat in the chair, I'd be more relaxed, and it will hold me up. That's number two. I have to have that because I can have some knowledge but not believe it's true. I'll never get to saving faith. So I have to go to number two. But that still doesn't save me. That's a lot of people that can tell you all about Jesus Christ, who he is, about the Bible. But they themselves have never gone to step three. And I say this in all the love I can. You might be at step two right now and you think your step two is enough that's getting you into heaven because you know this truth. But you have yet to fully, completely trusted him so step three is very simple it's the word fiducia and that basically means you act on the facts that are true by then placing your faith in christ so you have to hear the facts you have to believe they're true then watch this if the chair was up here then i have to put my okoli on it and then lift up my legs and to know that it'll hold me up now saving faith is i have to hear who jesus christ is i have to believe that he is god that he did die he did pay for all the sin of the world he did rise again that salvation is by faith alone and not by my works i have to believe that is true but even then i haven't trusted christ until i come to the point where i'm now saying you know i know that to be true i am needing this i admit that i need christ as my savior and i am now placing my confidence my trust my dependency my assurance in jesus christ In other words, if I was to fall back, the only one who could hold me from crashing into hell when I die is the arms of Jesus Christ. And that act of trusting him and him alone, that's step number three. And that's what saves us now. Remember, I gave you this many times before, but watch what we're going to do now. The first one deals with knowledge. The second one deals with emotions. The third one deals with will. So it goes to the part of man that's, you know, mind, will, emotions. You've heard those, that, that little triumphant that thing going on. So all three of those need to be involved in what we call saving faith. So when we say we have faith in the truth, we have faith in the truth that Jesus is God, that Jesus loved us, went to the cross, that God gave his son, that Jesus rose again, that Jesus says my good works can't get me to heaven, but my faith in him will, and now I have eternal life. So that gives me eternal life. But that only sets me free from the plight of hell. But that still doesn't mean I may not slip into bondage here. I won't lose my salvation, but I'm in bondage. Now, we who are in the pastorate, uh, we, we deal with a lot of people that we know, we know that they have trusted Christ as best as we can. They've authentically placed their faith in Christ, but you look and they still struggle sometimes with it. And the truth can really make you free. So what are the three steps to simple freedom? Let's go back to John chapter 8 again. So he spoke these things and many believed in him. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him. Now I don't want to split a hair again, but listen carefully. It's quite possible that there are two groups of people that are listening in to Jesus' message. You have those who believed in him who are the authentic Christians. They were third step faith, okay? The second group would be, so Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him. In other words, they believed that he was speaking truth, but they haven't placed their faith in him. But as they're hearing this truth, watch this, because they haven't gone to the third step, you're going to see that they move very rapidly away from believing him to now hating him. In the very last verse of the chapter, they're picking up rocks to put him to sleep, if you know what I mean. And so that's why there's some people that you know that can speak about Christianity and next thing you know, they are just going whole hog against God and against Christ. One time they might have believed, 
but they didn't believe in a full force confidence in him. So let's look at it just in this passage now. All right, verse 31, and it says this. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed in him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Now, if this is your Bible, you might want to circle, first of all, the word continue, if you continue in my word. Another word for that would be the word abide, if you'll abide in his word. And what does it mean to abide or to continue in his word? Well, in John chapter 15, it says to abide in Christ. And I like that because Christ in the word, you have the living Christ and then you have the written Christ. This is the written Christ if you abide in it. Well, when you abide in this and you continue in this, it means that this becomes your whole being. This becomes who you want to be. This becomes your safety net. This becomes your value system. This becomes your mind. This becomes everything that you need to know about this life and the next life. This becomes so very critical to you. Now let me see if I can use an earthly illustration from Hawaii. This has never happened to me, and I pray that it's never happened to me as I would pray it would never happen to you. But you have read stories about guys who've been out paddling, whether it's on a boogie board or hopefully even on a surfboard, at least that. And while they're paddling around out there, all of a sudden they encounter a shark. Have you ever read a story about that, or has that ever happened to you? Would you raise your hand? Okay. Now, when, they, when you see this, you don't see that surfer say, oh, there's a shark, abandon my surfboard, let me dive in. No, they don't do that. What do they do? If, if, I don't know what they do. I know what I would do. I would sit any way that I could on top of this board and there wouldn't be one of my little appendages dangling into this water right here and I would be praying as fast as I could, oh God, please forgive me of every sin. I won't know more, you know, kind of thing. I would be abiding in that board. I would need this board for my very, very survival. And so when you and I come to the point that says, you know, God, Jesus, spirit, word is truth. I want this truth. I want to abide in this because I believe it's true. I love its truth. I will obey this truth and I will now therefore continue in this truth. So I need to abide in it. If I do, then I will know the truth and the truth will set me free. Now, listen very carefully to what I'm going to say now. Here's a question that I'm, I'm asked a lot. How will I know that as a Christian, I'm right and those people could be wrong? H- how would I know that my doctrine is sound? Now, I don't have time to, I, this, we'll be here all year on this, but if you'd like to have an outline that I gave to the men that I taught here in our men's Bible study on how you can know your doctrine is sound, you're going to find that there's simple steps. First, you have to trust Christ as Savior. Second, you have to be willing to do His will. Then you have to do his will, which is abiding in here, because once you've said, I want to know the book, and I want to do whatever this book says, the Holy Spirit finds within you a person who is very easy to be taught truth, and God will do it. The people today that get off in these tangents and tangents out there is because they haven't chosen to say, I will live by this book. Oh, they might say, I want to know the book, But they haven't said, I want to live by the book. I want to know the book. Their flesh takes over because they haven't decided to make the decision based on the book. So now they're knowing the book, but they have their own value systems of wrong motives. And so they begin to pick and choose out of the book. And then they create their own isms and spasms and all of this stuff. And we have these people going off a deep end in the name of Christianity. Because they haven't gone back to say, I want to live safely in the confines of this book. Because I know I live in a world that is saturated with sharks. And I want to stay safe. So I have to abide in this truth. And if I do, it says here, this truth will set me free. So let me pause and give you some ideas. If you're to the point now that you believe that this is truth, although you say, I don't know a lot of the book right here, that's okay. The Lord delights in humility, by the way. But to say, I don't know a lot about it, but no big deal, then the Lord grieves. Because he says, we need to study this book right here. We need to know this book right here. So let me encourage you that when you are out looking for a church, and you don't find churches that merely get three points in a poem and a lot of jokes and jump it up and down. It's not how high you jump on Sunday. It's how straight, according to the book, you walk on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. You want to make sure that you are in a Bible study that is teaching the book. No matter what other kind of other books they have out there, the Bible is still on top of that book. You want to make sure that you are in a setting where you've got people that are helping you hermeneutically. That's the proper interpretation of Scripture to know the book. That's abiding in this book. And today, 
it's not being done. It's kids' Sunday schools and all the rest. I, let me give you something a little humorous here. This was found in National Review Magazine. This is one child wrote about what they thought the Bible said. said, in the first book of the Bible, Guinness World Records, <clears throat> God got tired of creating the world, so he took the Sabbath off. Adam and Eve were created from an apple tree, and Noah's wife was called Joan of Arc. Lot's wife was a pillar of salt by day and a ball of fire by night. <laughs> the Jews were proud people, and throughout history, they had trouble. They meant Gentiles. They just misspelled it. Okay, just relax, okay. Moses led the Hebrews to the Red Sea where they made unleavened bread, which is bread made without ingredients, which is really incredible. (laughs) Afterwards, Moses went up to Mount Sinai to get the Ten Amendments. The Fifth Commandment is humor thy father and mother. The Seventh Commandment is thou shall not admit adultery. Another child said Joshua led the Hebrews in the battle of Jericho, and the greatest miracle in the Bible is when Joshua told his son to stand still and he obeyed him. Now, We're chuckling over that, and that's okay to chuckle because it's little kid stuff. But when we choose to somehow get our own theology a little bit off, we get a little messed up. But when we start messing up the theology, I'm going to tell you it is tragic. Watch this. What you think, you'll feel. What you feel, you will do. So if you have wrong thinking because you don't have right knowledge, it will affect how you are. And it, when it affects you, since we do not live in a bubble, it will affect all those people that are around us, starting with our mate, our families, the people we work with, people in church. And then Christianity gets a bad name in this world because what's happening is that's not authentic, genuine, accurate Christianity. And it goes down from there. So well, I, I'll laugh at all of this stuff. But I grieve because it's probably uh, pretty close to what some people do believe on some issues of the Bible, etc. And we don't want to do that. And I hope that wouldn't be the case. So here's the question. How do I have a breakthrough to freedom? How do I have a breakthrough? First of all, you need to admit that you are a prisoner. You have to admit that you're a prisoner. We're going to see it where the Jews struggle with recognizing that they were enslaved. So if you want, you can kind of follow along now as we take you through this. It says, then they answered him, those Jewish people who believed him but didn't believe in him. And they answered him and said, we are Abraham's descendants and have never yet been enslaved to anyone. Ooh, I, gotta, I can't go. I, you got to get this. And I'm speaking to those that don't know a whole lot about the Bible. Do not feel badly. I did not go in a Christian home. I, when I was given my first Bible, I thought it was in alphabetical order. I am not speaking down at you. I'm speaking because I've been where you are, and I know how you feel, and I want you to get where others are, so you're not left there. I love you. You have the Jews. The Jews came from a guy by the name of Abraham, and Abraham promised through him all the nations of the world would be blessed because it was through him that the Savior, Jesus, would come. Jesus is Jewish, all right? It also said that they would be given a special lamp. Okay, you got all that that's going on over there, and it started with Abraham. Watch this. Abraham believed in the Lord. The word Lord there is Jehovah, God who saves. He believed in Jehovah, and that was counted him for righteousness, which means now he is righteous to go to heaven, not based on his works, but because God put it on his account. He says, you are now righteous to get into heaven because you believed in the Lord. So that started it. Listen, listen. So you have what is known as a physical descendancy from Abraham, Jews, and then you have a spiritual descendancy from Abraham, which would be anyone who's trusted in the Lord like the first Jew did, which would be Abraham, all right? That's how it got started. Now they're saying, we've never been slaves. Now I'm going to tell you, to me, and I read this, I'm saying, didn't you read your own Old Testament? You were a slave with Egypt. Don't you remember? You were a slave in Egypt. And then from there it moved to Assyria. Then it moved to Babylon. And then it moved to the Medes and Persians. Then it moved to the uh, uh, Greece. And then it moved to... Syria, and then and right here, this story right here that's happening, they're enslaved to Rome at that time. So how could they say, I'm not enslaved? They've been enslaved. They know what slavery is about. We've never been enslaved. Yes, you have. In addition to that, they were slaved to all this religious paganism. Just read the Old Testament. It's horrible. Then get a history book and read what the Old Testament says about the paganism. Then it'll, it'll make you throw up. It was so gross. And they were enslaved to all the Baals and Ashtaroths and all that kind of stuff. How can they say they weren't enslaved? They were enslaved. And the Lord knows all of that, so he doesn't really come against them much because now he's saying what the real slavery isn't so much the political arena or even so much their religiosity stuff with all that other paganism. They're really enslaved within them to sin. So now he's talking about, watch this, watch this, the freedom you have when you trust Christ that you'll have forever. 
And we'll also talk about the freedom you can have today when you continue in his word. You're listening to Make It Clear with the teaching of Dr. Stan Pons, founder of Make It Clear Ministries and president of Florida Bible College in beautiful Orlando, Florida. Make It Clear is dedicated to taking the Word of God with clarity into every person's world. It is the support of listeners like you who make the ministry of Make It Clear possible. You can provide your tax-deductible gift to Make It Clear online by going to makeitclear.org. Or you can mail your gift to Make It Clear, P.O. Box 607-901, Orlando, Florida, 32860. Thank you for helping us make it clear. If you would like to have Dr. Pond speak at your church or event, please send us an email at tellmemore at makeitclear.org. Thank you, and remember to make it clear.